Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am Panchas and welcome to Endless Legend which is now officially in beta. Which is a big step forward for all of us, however for those of us that were brave and ballsy enough to try the branch build, there are too many changes from what you have seen last. For example, if you have watched my other mages playthrough, most of the changes there are still in this beta build, with some slight improvements and of course a ton of bug fixes. However, there is one thing that I'll dedicate this series to, which has appeared in this beta test and was previously unavailable to anyone, and those are the, those are the roving clans. A new faction that you can now officially play as and look at this stylish mustache. It's it's so good. It really just is so good. So what are those people? When well, you can read the description if you are into this, or you can just continue watching this video cast if you are looking for tips on how to play as them. They are a bit different than what you might first expect though. They are a nation that according to the developers is focusing heavily on the market. And uh, although they have some traits that do focus on the market, I have to say personally, I believe that's not where their strength lies. Now, for those of you who are new to my channel, I probably need to specify, I am, uh, let's call it, that's how I'm called, a VIP member of the Amplitude Forums, which means I get to play this, this game in its earlier builds before they are published. So I already played as the... Roving Clans before they were officially released. Not a whole lot, unfortunately, but I played as a bit. And they are a really interesting faction. And as I said, they can be very different to what you would normally expect. For example, if you look at their traits, there is something called Peace and Prosperity. Wait, no, that's that's not it. Uh, make trade, not war. That's the right one. Which means that you cannot declare war, ever. Under any circumstances, you are physically unable to declare war on anybody. You can have other people declare war on you, however you yourself cannot declare war. Now, you may be thinking, okay, so they are the kind of boring faction you that has to go for wealth, victory and stuff like that. No, 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 no. You don't even understand. When I played as them, myself, by, you know, when I was testing the game, I absolutely annihilated a Necrophage Empire. A Necrophage Empire, you know, one of the best rushers in the game. I annihilated them very heavily before 10 100, or even way before that. I believe it was 10 like 70, maybe less so, even maybe 60, as Raven class, without ever even declaring war on them either. How is that possible? Oh, I'm going to teach you that. But I need to load the game first. So, the standard caveat applies. I will now go for six factions because there are six factions in the game. And I will, of course, play as the Roving Clans with my favorite green color. My opponents will be uh, every other faction in the game. So, that's the Wild Walkers, that's the Broken Lords, Neckphages, Arden Mages. I love Arden Mages so much. And last, but by no means least, who is left? Vorders. There we go. Now, as for the world settings, what am I going to go for? World size is going to remain normal. I believe that large is too large, for, even for six players. Large is good if you are in a group of seven or eight people, and even then, I would probably suggest that you play the multiplayer because against AI, it could potentially get a little bit ish dull. World shape, Pangea, that's what I played on multiplayer. No, I'll go for two continents. Sounds nice. I might go for that. I mean, other options include large islands or islands. Now. I want to warn you that large islands, in my idea, is not a very good idea. <laughs> in my idea, in my mind. Because when you spawn large islands, you just get an island, which is one giant region, and that's it. And each island is one region, which is fairly dull gameplay, in my opinion. We're going to go for two continents. It's a fairly stable thing to go for. And now I pause the recording as we generate the world, so I'll be right back. Okay, we have just loaded in. There is our stylish hero and his standard army of a settler and two dervish. Now, the first thing I need to mention that you probably already noticed yourself. Our movement. We have a movement of six, including the fact that we have a settler in our army. Compare that to the usual movement of other armies that uh, usually caps out at four or less if they have slow units in there. That is not what you can expect from roving clans. Roving clans have all of their units are incredibly fast, as in all of their units have six movement, and you can cover very long distances very easily with those units. 
They are probably the best map roamers in the game right now because you can escalate the entire world in a blink of an eye. So first things first, we'll do the standard tactic by splitting our army and searching the area around for good places to settle. I'll talk a bit more about settling in a second, but let's let's just have a quick look around, shall we? It's something that you have to do regardless, so we might as well go ahead and give it a try. There's an Ursus village nearby, that's okay. There are, by the way, two more minor factions in this patch. There are the Orcs, they're called differently, but they're Orcs, with bows and whatnot. Very good unit, very good empire to assimilate. And the other are the Minotaurs, which are treated as cavalry. And they are also very good, in all honesty. They will be solid additions to the game, I feel. Alright, just got some stuff over there. Let's have a quick look with another dervish, like right over here, let's say. And see how things are going. There's a desert nearby, good to know. We'll probably make good use of that sooner or later. But let's keep going. And we have just got quite a bit of terrain, looks like. Our starting region is quite small, but things around it are relatively dry, with a bit of food on the right side and a bit of dust on the left side. Okay, okay. Now, I need to settle. So, as usual, you will be wondering what kind of Fitzy you will be looking for when selling as the Raven Clans. Raven Clan, whatever they're called. Raven Clans, I believe. Now, in my experience, you do need to focus primarily on two resources. Food and science, because those will be the resources that you will need and not necessarily have a very big income of. Although there are some things that you have that will help you with that, some technologies that you unlock, but you will need as much food and science as possible, that is my experience thus far, after a few hours of playing with them. And I believe that this is what you should focus for. Dust is also good. You will need it, but you have other sources of dust, especially in the multiplayer. All those uh, things on the marketplace. Whenever it's a different player trades anything in a marketplace, you get 10% of that deal. So yes, let's say that somebody buys dust orchid for 50 dust. You gain 5 dust from it. Uh, which is amazing and uh, we have been discussing on the VIP forums the possibility that it might make some players you know not want to use the marketplace at all when they are fighting against roving clans and yeah we are discussing this a lot but either way this is how things are going right now so you can, will have sources of dust although you still want to have it so food and science is your most important uh, your most important resources dust is important but less so the least important resource is industry production, because you will not need a whole lot of it. At the very start of the game, you will need a bit, so you want to settle where there is at least some industry, but after the beginning, you will never really care about it too much. You buy your way through the game, and uh, yeah, so you don't need to care too much about this industry. So let's think where to settle. Well, I like to settle next to the coast, because you can then create, you can then use a bunch of structures that improve your water tiles and there's plenty of them we are fairly close to a river which also improves us in the same way there is a dragon tree nearby which gives us happiness which is very important and also gives us a lot of everything else so this would be a nice stable place selling over here would give me a lot of <laughs> industry which is kind of annoying because as i said we don't need it per se but it's not like we don't want it so it would still be useful there is quite a bit of food especially after improving the water tiles we'll have even more food However, what I'm a bit worried about is that there is no science. There's two science on the dragon tree and this is it. If I settle on the dragon here, the tree, I'll gain four science, which will be slightly better. I will gain less industry, which is okay, as I said, and I'll gain more or less the same amount of dust and uh, food. So I think I might settle directly on the dragon tree, which is not a very bad idea. I could also settle here. I will be away from the water for now, but I will be close to the rumbling stones in the future and I will be right next to Geothermal Pit, which again gives us more science. In fact, by settling here, I will gain the most science out possible and I'll still gain a lot of food, dust and some production. So I think I'll go over here. Now, the cool thing is, as a roving class, you don't need to worry too much about where you settle. Not nearly as much as when you play as other factions. And you can almost always settle in the first turn, even if there are no ideal spots. Why? Well, let me show you. Let's say that I want to settle here, because I do. So let's go ahead, settle our first city. That's very nice. It erects. It's... Our hero is in the way, kinda. So let's move him ever uh, a bit, so he's no longer in the way. It's a giant scarp. That's adorable, isn't it? Yeah, that, that is actually our city. It is a giant scarp. Mechanical scarp. Now, what can scarps do? 
that can walk. This city can also walk. If I purchase this improvement, which is more like an action than an improvement, it always takes exactly 110, and after it's done, this guy stands on his feet and he can walk around. Like a scab, except it's a city that walks around, and it can walk around anywhere, including walking to different regions, just to settle your city in a different region where you previously settled it. So let's say there's a region that is lush, filled with food and whatnot. Okay, you settle there, you gather food, you feed your people, you gain a nice healthy population, and then you're done with it. So you pick your, you pack your bags, you leave, and then you go into an area that is filled with, let's say, production, dust or science, and then you take the benefits of that and ignore the lack of food because you already have the population you need. Pretty neat, isn't it? I'll talk about it and the relation I have about it and the major faction competition that you know happened some time ago on the forums because I did have some critical you know points and remarks, but that can wait until the end of the video. Right now, I'm here to teach you. So. I could do that, of course I'm not going to do that because there is little point to moving my city after I have just settled it, and yes, your city does not function as it is moving around, because well, it would be too powerful, you, you have to have it settled back down. However, if you have several districts, because remember you, remember, you can make districts in this game, if you have several districts, you pack them as well, and then redeploy them as well. You do not even have to move your city center, you can stay where you are, but you can just shuffle your city districts in any way you please. ANY way you please. Sickeningly good, I'm really happy about it. Anyway, what do you want to start producing first as the Rover Clans? Well, you can go for the military approach, no reason. Or you can go ahead and make Father's Memorial. Do that! Why not? Have it. It's a good thing to have. It will take us some time to make. 11 tens is quite a bit, but it's not the worst thing ever. I like to keep my population point, the first population point at food production, however, so I can get the next population in 3 tens instead of 4 in this case. Which would speed up the production of Founders Memorial significantly. That is by 5 tens. I will not only delay our food, uh, next population by 1 tenth, so I actually think I might focus on industry instead now that I think about it. This is basically one of the very few instances when you care about industry as roving clans. The early game. After that you probably never care about it again. Alright then, so this is what we are doing right now. Good. Now what else do we need to do? Turn off this grid, that's the first thing. Second thing, science. Let's have a quick look at science. Now, is there anything special that you see here? Well, we start with the rookery we researched, which allows us to buy heroes. Oh, that's nice. And I think I was unlocked. Mm, no, oh, wait, hey, hey, what's this? That, that is imper Oh, wait, wait a second, what? It is already unlocked. Yes, it is already unlocked. As a roving class, you start by having access to not only the heroes marketplace, but also Imperial Coinage, that is the resources marketplace, and from Era 3. Mercenary Marketplace! Yes! You start with it unlocked! You don't have to go to Era 3! You already have it! Which is a significant bonus! A significant bonus! So if I go to Marketplace, I can buy stuff right now. I mean, I can't because there are no market mercenaries available at this point in time. And even if there were, I wouldn't be able to buy them with just 50 dust. But I have access to the stub. I can buy things. Significant! Magnificent. Incredible. Luxuries. Yeah, I can buy things. Strategic resources. Yeah, I can buy things right now, in fact, because there are already some on the market. I will not do that, however. I'll tell you why later. And yeah, other things. They are not in the market yet, but starting next time, they'll start flowing in. Heroes. That is less significant, but yeah, I can buy heroes. In fact, I will as soon as possible for reasons that I'll discuss soon. So this is significant. It's one of the reasons why this faction is set up on the marketplace, and there are ways to abuse it, and I'll gladly teach you all of them. But that's a lot to talk about, so let's wait with that. What do you want to research first? In my eyes, with this faction, there's not even a question about it. If you have a stable enough source of science in your city, and I have nine, that's good enough, it's not amazing, it's okay, then I would say go for the third party. It is going to take 6 tens, which is borderline acceptable. I usually wouldn't bother with it if it takes 4 tens or more. In fact, 6 tens, if I have to be honest, probably if I were playing this seriously in multiplayer or whatnot, I would maybe not do it. 6 tens is a lot of time, I have to say. Usually, perhaps I would instead go for the seed storage and the mill foundry. 
Again, a very stable combo that you can go for, for as pretty much every s faction in the game. And it gives you this very nice early boost to food and pro industry production in every game. However, I it, if you if you can get it fairly quickly, like with, let's say 5, 4, 3, or even 2, 10, go for the search party. Because, well, why? I'll tell you very quickly. Just look at this movement. With 6 movement, you'll be able to find those ruin sites very, very quickly. Very incredibly quickly, in fact, not just very quickly, which is a significant advantage to you. And with search pattern, which increases the odds of finding something amazing in Rune Ruins, it will pay off really quickly. That said, six tens is too la too much in my eyes. Five tens, that would be borderline unacceptable. Four tens is good. Three and two is amazing. Six is too much in my eyes. I'll go for sister first and mill foundry instead. If, however, you have a little bit of a better size income. Then you should go for a search party, or maybe if you for some reason want to go for that and put population science, you can go for that as well. I wouldn't do that, you need that population point working on something else instead in my eyes. But there is that, you now know about science. How about major, f I mean minor factions that you want to assimilate, what do you want to be looking for? I should discuss this right away because... Obviously, you will try to settle in regions that do have the minor factions that you may want. I'll end the 10 because that is not the minor faction I had in mind. In fact, Ramblers are probably one of the worst minor factions you can simulate. Yes, they are fairly good tank slash damage dealing guys and they lower the production cost of structures and whatnot. Thing is, you don't really care about it. As for those units, they are a pathetic addition to your army, because your army is highly mobile, and it will for the most part focus on kiting the enemy around while dealing devastating blows. So if you want an army, a unit to accompany your army, then you need something fast and agile. Ursus are not that. <coughs> if you however want to have a defender for your main cities, there are way better defenders than Ursus, trust me. I would not recommend them. They are usually a very good minor factions for other major factions when you play as other major factions, but when you play as the roving class, my suggestion, don't assimilate your sis. If you don't have other good choices, it's okay, but it's nothing like special, it really isn't. So let's end the 10. Can I end the 10 now? Yes, I can. It will also give us our first major faction quest, so let's go ahead and do just that. There are other things, however, that I will need to talk about, but first things first... Oh, they added the artwork, that's nice. I'm happy because in the build test I was testing before, there was no artwork, there was just a big yellow window saying, yeah, chapter one. <laughs> that's what it said. That's, uh, you know, I wasn't really immersed back then, but this is, this is nice looking, that's very nice. All right, so, uh, my current objective, make sure that all sisters of massive villagers are pacified in the region where there are indicated ruins. So in this region, there are sisters of massive villagers. In fact, I can see one right here. I need to pacify them. This will always be your first quest. So far, I've been very lucky. It was giving me this quest to pacify some very easy villagers like Seraton or sisters of mercy. But I think it's random. You can get effed over it quite easily. However, you will be starting units, you should be able to do it by force with relative ease, depending on how many villagers you have to pacify. I was able to pacify two with ease without losing, uh, with losing one unit, unit, but without losing a hero. So two villagers, good, you can do it without, without reinforcement, with just a hero and one unit. Three villagers, you need some more to actually be able to fulfill this quest. So we have to scout around and see how it goes. So let's go ahead and make my way over here-ish, like so. I don't want to discard those ruins, but they can wait. I'll walk through here, see what is inside those ruins. Uh, locked by an... Um, what? There we go. Somebody must have been in a fight in this region. That's why I wasn't able to engage in a... Uh, to expand... To set those ruins. Unfortunately, they were empty. That's something that we needed the set party for. But as I said, six tests in my slightly-ish too long. Just slightly, but still too long. I don't like wasting this much time on this kind of research. Alright, Sisters of Mercy encountered well, what a surprise! The worst minor faction in the game is still, I still fail to see them being useful for any empire, with one exception when they are arguably sometimes kinda ish okay ish. They are really bad and they need to be buffed in my eyes because right now they are pathetic, except when you want to kill them, then they are nice because you know you can kill them nice and easily. 
Those guys, well, let's keep exploring. Unfortunately, there are forests in the way, so it will take us some time. But it's a nice lush region. I will probably set with a second city over here to make it develop fast. I mean, hidden springs, that's a lot of food. And there's clay. Yeah, that's okay. Clay, okay. A rhyme, okay. Uh, there is a river and forest with magical forest, so there is a bit of science and a lot of food, and food is important. And the skeptic specimens there, uh, not a very big deal. Alrighty then. Something else I was going to talk about, oh yeah, the marketplace, but we can still wait a bit about that. But the thing is, what I was trying to discuss, in the future you will need to buy out a Wild Walker's hero. I can already spoil that for you, this will be a faction quest. It will also be a very early faction quest. Now, we were lucky enough to actually get a Wild Walkers hero in a marketplace. So as you may not be this lucky, you may have to wait, but you will always eventually get a Wild Walkers hero to be able to fulfill your faction quest. It's a bit randomized, it's a bit luck dependent, but hey, as are, are many other aspects of this game, you have to brace it. We, however, start with access to this Wild Walkers hero. He will be exclusive for 14 turns. Within those 14 turns, we want to hire him, because if we don't, then he will stop being exclusive and there is a chance some other player would hire him and we would no longer be able to hire a Wild Walkers hero and as I said, we need to because of our major faction quest that we will gain in the future. Well, so with that being said, we need to start summing our dust. We need 250, we have 62, gaining 12 out of 10. We are not there yet, however, I will show you a fairly nice trick to get it. I think the trick will actually reveal itself. Now, since we're already in a marketplace, I think I can discuss one other thing already. Just to, you know, show you what I mean, I will not do it right now because I don't have the means to do it. But let's just... Actually, let's wait a bit more. I need some stockpiles to already start being, you know, put on the marketplace. Right now, quantity is zero all across the board. I'll wait, I'll wait, it's okay. Alrighty then, let's go ahead and finish this turn. Now, I didn't talk about one other thing, and that is the military of the roving clans. And that's actually a very big part, so before attacking, talk briefly about it. As roving clans, as I, as I said, you are very mobile. All of your units, including your heroes and your settlers, have six movement on by, you know, by default. So you move extraordinarily fast no matter what. Now, what uh, are your units? So first things first, you have your stunning settler, who is a seller? And there's a cute little adorable pug sitting on a pillow. Because hey, why not? Everybody knows that Stephanie loves her pugs. So there had to be a pug in the game. And there is a pug in the game. He's adorable. <laughs> anyway, so this is your seller. Nothing to talk about over here except for a pug. Then there is your dervish. Which is a cavalry that you have unlocked at the start. Which is weaker than... Uh, Stat-wise, that is. It is weaker than pretty much anything else in the game for any other faction. It is fast, it does have charge. So, if you attack from far away, yeah, you attack hard and you attack a decent amount of damage. Only decent, though, because as I said, when you look at the stats, what you should think, oh, they are actually very, very mediocre. Well, they're not bad. They have a decent amount of life, a decent amount of attack. I think they might actually have too much. Maybe it is a bug. Either way, they... What... The devs are going for, in terms of the Roving Clans units, although I seriously think they have been buffed, the devs have been buffed, because they used to have less attack. Either way, the idea that the devs have about Roving Clans units is that they are supposed to be slightly weaker than your average normal units for other major factions. So, if you are fighting head-on against army that is equal in size but of a different kind, you probably lose, so you don't do it. That's the general idea. However, let's have a quick look at the, some other uh, units you can get. The uh, next unit you can get is the Kasai, which are ranged units on a horse. We have 7 speed on the map, 6... wait... something speed, I think it's 4 or 3, whatever. Big speed on the battle screen as well. And they have fast one, night, block one and night slayer. Block one comes from the shield, by the way. You probably want to get rid of that to give them bows, because with bows those guys are way better. Now, what is so awesome about those guys? Uh, they can kite other people, like, forever. They are really fast in the battlefield and they attack from afar, which means that if you are fighting against slower enemies, you can kite them endlessly. It was already true with other ranged fighters in the game before, yes, but with Kasai it is even more so true, and you can kite even slightly faster enemies longer. As in, significantly longer. So, those guys are... Well, they do not have an amazing attack, of, they only have 70 attack at 6 critical. They have very nice consistent damage without giving the opponent ability to strike back, which in itself makes them a very nice unit. They are also very cheap, 55 industry, yeah, 
I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll buy that for a dollar. And then there's the last thing, and that is the year mark. I'll be honest, because we were not given a lot of time to test this game. I mean, test this faction before it came out publicly. I was not actually able to test it outright. I'm sorry for this. It is actually considered an infantry, but it is still fast on the uh, map as well. Uh, have they lowered the... Oh yeah, they have lowered his speed, haven't they? It's five. Okay, that's interesting. So it's not as fast, but it's still pretty fast. Five speed is more than the average speed of any other major faction. So, and uh, with some exceptions, of course. So he's still very fast, but he also can stump quite well. He has decent attack, he's got a decent life, critical, initiative is okay, defense is kind of on the low side. Uh, so, it's not amazing, it's a slightly better version of your Darvish. It's slightly slower, but it's still very fast. It is, however, considered an infantry for some reason. Which uh, is a little bit weird, but it's okay. And it does have the fast trait as well. So, yeah, it is an okay unit. None of your units, as you can see, however, are amazing. And aside from the range guy, who is very good at kiting, nobody has any special abilities per se. Aside from fast, they don't have any fast skills, they don't cast lying bots, no, 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 no. You are all, you, the one thing that you think about as roving class all the time, constantly, is kiting the enemy. And you're very good with that. However, because of things I'll discuss in a moment, you don't even want to use your military. No, that would be too simple. There are more sinister things to do, but we'll talk about them in a second. Right now, we need some combat in this video, don't we? Yeah, let's go ahead. Attack your justice here. There are two of them. Easy pickings. Let's go ahead and wipe them off the face of the air. Also, by going into the manual, as you can see, obviously, we review quite a bit of terrain size around us, so we know what is happening. Alrighty then, two uh, Dusty Sears, they have the better initiative, okay, good for them. How do I want to settle my units? Well, my hero does not have a charge ability. Uh, he is quite tanky and will not, so... I also do him relatively close to the Dusty Sears, they can walk two towns, so... But only one through a forest, so they will be able to walk to this tower, I believe. And they will not be able to walk to this tower, so I can simply walk... Uh, the set of my unit over here, and the enemy will not be able to reach me in a single turn. Whereas I will be because I have more speed on the battlefield. As you can see, I have three, and they only have two. Poor, poor bastards. As for those guys, oh, they have charge, so they're gonna have to go on the high ground. And what I intend to do is to charge them from this angle. Now, how to charge? I believe it is actually not implemented. I didn't get any confirmation about it from the devs, but I was doing some experiments on my own. And I have noticed that the damage I deal varies quite a bit, more so than it should based on the difference between height and of me and my enemy, and any other bonuses. So I believe the charge might be implemented, however it is also possible that the differences in damage I have seen before were as a result of some other stat that I was previously unaware of that also took itself into account. So maybe charge works now? Maybe it doesn't. I cannot give you a full confirmation that. However, I have seen the attack vary, so it's possible that it works now. If it does work, however, do not expect big results. You gain an increase of like, let's say, a free attack if you charge well. I mean, free attack if you charge well, whereas you wouldn't get this free attack if you didn't charge well. You are going to get some increase in attack regardless. It's depending on how, from how far away you're going to charge. That determines how much damage you're going to deal. Again, if charge is truly implemented yet, which I cannot confirm as of now. Let's go ahead and charge the enemy. Why not? The enemy will try to charge us, which is again okay, because they will be not able to actually reach me in one turn. Alrighty then, I'll go ahead and actually I completely forgot that my hero is ranged. I keep forgetting that, and my unit it was also retarded enough, it's now going to walk through here. The reason being, I told it to attack this Justice here, and this Justice here walked here, and the other Justice here blocked my path, so that's kinda annoying. So, my hero is actually a ranged hero, he does not benefit from attacking from close up. I can't even forget that he's actually ranged, because he doesn't look like he's ranged, you know? But I keep doing it. Either way, it doesn't matter. I can now charge this justice here and deal immense damage to her. 25 is a nice amount. And again, it makes me feel that I indeed do have the charge ability. Otherwise, I shouldn't be able to deal this much damage. But again, this might be not true. Not a fact. Alright, so uh, my hero is going to attack. Not deal too much damage. But 26 is okay, but it's not amazing. And then my units are going to go ahead and attack again. The enemy is on high ground, so this will give her a bit more of a defense. 36... Wow, how did we do 36? I have no clue. That was kind of sick. Alright, 
the enemy village is banned. Is that enough? Yes, it is. There was only a single village. I get 30 influence. That's a really good reward because with influence, you might be struggling a little bit as the roving clans. Not a big deal, but something that is always nice to have. That said, a funny thing I discovered as the roving class, you don't really need this influence. At least not in the 1020 Empire plan. On 1040 Empire plan, your influence will actually be fairly useful because you probably want to go for two fingers at once. I'll show you what later in the next video probably. But your 1020 Empire plan is not really a big deal. I actually honestly thought last time I played as them to not go for anything and this time around I might literally just not go for any Empire plan on 1020 because they don't benefit you too much. It's sometimes a bad idea to just save up your influence. All done with now me having 30, I might think again. Either way, now what I gained is I need to search the unspot ruins and I'll gain Roads of Dust, which is an amazing artifact. Because you just equip it on your hero and he gains, uh, he gives your city extra 8 industry. Or he gains extra 1 movement if he's, if he's leading an army. And from what I've been able to do last uh, last time I tried, you can actually cover it multiple times, which I don't know how it makes sense, but I was able to do it. Maybe it was a bug that was fixed, so don't back on you being able to do it again, but I was able to multi multiply this item. Again, that's probably that it was probably a bug, but it's still a very nice item to have. It does cost some dust to equip it, however. Or maybe industry, doesn't matter. Alright, so either way I have to set those ruins and uh, then I'll gain this particular item, which will be very nice. My other scout is going to continue lacking around, that's more Ursus villages, I don't care about those too much. I just hope they don't, uh, uh, you know, pressure me too much, if at all possible. Seratan! Not what I'm looking for again. I want to find one of the main minor factors you should be on the lookout for, to tell you what you should be looking for, but it looks like I don't have the luck right now. So let's go ahead and end this stand. I'll gain a new faction quest in the next stand, probably. My hero leveled up. Alright, I'll give him Indiana Bones to get better ruins if at all possible. Now, unfortunately, as you will see now, the Ruben class heroes are fairly underwhelming because they're not too good at leading armies, they're not too good at being governors either. I mean, you know those two trees, you have seen them before. This tree, well, let's show it to you right now. This gives you more dust on terrain of anomaly. Fairly okay. If you have a lot of anomalies, it's okay. Otherwise, it's fairly meh. Then you get free embark as a bank on army size, which right now doesn't work. Then you can get extra trade art bonuses, which doesn't work. Then you can get extra dust per trade art, which doesn't work. Can you see where I'm going? And then you can also get extra black market bonus on city, which again doesn't work. That is why I say that those guys are pretty underwhelming as governors. In the future, sure, I can imagine them being pretty good governors. Right now they are the last choice you, you ever want to take into consideration when letting those guys govern the city because those skills are not implemented yet. So don't bother. This skill however is implemented. Extra unit, industry cost reduction. That's okay. But Necrophages here have pretty much the same deal, except earlier and better. So... don't even bother. Those heroes are not good for much. Just give them Indiana Bones, give them no idle hands and just let them be... Let them handle their daily business and sell them on the marketplace later. That's what I do. They sell for quite well. I mean, I was able to sell them for like 200 dust. That's a pretty nice amount of dust. So yeah, let them level up your units for now and then get rid of them because they're useless. Either way, let's go ahead and explore those ruins. I said explore those ruins, thank you. So there is that. Roads of dust are now here. Very nice. And again, as usual, usual caveat applies. You can read it if you so desire. Just go ahead and pause the video and you'll be able to read all of that. So, next quest is... The road is going to be high towers, which is the tech that will give us some extra science. However, right now what we have to do is get a Wild Walkers hero, give him the mana script, make him a leader of a city, and then I build high towers in a city. There is another reason why you don't want to have your primary hero as a governor, because you'll gain... You have to buy a governor soon anyway. And that governor is going to be this guy for us. Now, can you already guess why I don't think that having extra industry production around your city is important? I think you have a good idea already, don't you? Because when you go into this marketplace and have a quick look at hero, if you remember, Wild Walkers hero, what, heroes, what do they give you? Extra production. In a big way. In a really big way. In a really... No, that's not it. In a... That's big reduction cost. Yeah. So you will not really be needing a lot of industry anyway because you will have them. 
And we paired, paired up with this stone, which also gives you a flood bonus to industry, which is effective, very effective in early game. Yeah, you don't need to have a lot of industry in your area, setting area. You need some, don't get me wrong, but you don't need a lot. I mean, the amount I have is okay. It does mean that I have to wait quite a bit to actually get to Father's Memorial, but that's okay. Three turns is fine, and in, in three turns, in fact, I'll get six turrets. So again, it's really, really fine. I could buy this out, but I don't want to purely because I need to save my dust to buy other hero. So there is that. My hero, I already dealt with the points. And the scout, let's go ahead and keep scouting. Try to get on the high ground if possible, so walk like here. There's a cliff, that's annoying, but I keep walking. And there is a Volter Empire next to us. Good to know, that's okay. We don't really care about it too much. Let's set those runes. Four of glass too, not optimum, but... I'll be able to talk about this in a second, which is good because I wanted to. So let's go ahead and I cannot walk forward anymore today. Alright, so let's go back into Marketplace and show... It's still empty and again, isn't it? But let's let's talk about this. So what do we have? We have five glass steel. Are we going to use it? No, that is the answer to that. What can we do with that then? We can sell it. For how much? Oh, modest sum of 12.5 dust. How about we don't sell it? How about we keep on to it? How about we have a mass in our treasury among with, along with anything else that we can find in the ruins? Let it sit there, let it wait. And as we wait, the minimum price for any luxury resource on the marketplace is going to increase on a daily, on a 10 basis. I wasn't able to tell exactly by how much, but I'm pretty certain that the minimum price for anything increases by 0.1 each 10, which means that in 100 tens it will increase by 10, which is already a pretty big deal. So if you just hold on to your resources, then in some time, quite a long time, but still, you'll be able to sell them for a lot more. But it gets better. You start with the access to the marketplace as the roving class, don't you? Soon enough, there will be luxury resources pouring into here. You have to wait a bit longer though, it's only 10 4, keep that in mind. But soon enough, there will be things to buy here. What well, then? Then, you will eat until there's a decent enough quantity of them. Like, 5 is maybe too, not enough. 10 is good. You buy 10 of something for very cheap, because as the game starts, as you can see, things are super cheap. I mean, demand is low, prices are super low, you can buy whatever you want for super cheap. And only you can do it, because guess what, this technology that allows you to buy things is in era 2. Only you have access to it, nobody else does. So, as nobody else has access to Marketplace but you, you, you use that to your advantage. You buy out things while they are still cheap and you buy them in bulk. Because if you buy them one by one, you increase the price because you increase the demand and it will ruin, you ruin the market for yourself. No, 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 no. Wait until there's like 10 of them, buy them for cheap in a bulk and then never buy them again because the demand will be higher and the price will also go higher. Then, Keep a hold to your luxuries. If you need to, you will use them to buff your empire. That's fine, usually you will get a pretty good trade in terms of dust to something else ratio, depending on what luxury you bought. For example, dust orchid or whatever. But alternatively, you can just keep a hold on them. And then, when 10, let's say 100 comes, you sell them. And you ruin the market, because the way you do this is, let's say you have a big supply of... Uh, Let's say something that is very common. Wine. I have a lot of wine. Alright. So it is 10, let's say 80. I have a big super level of wine. I want to sell it for profit. But the demand is very low. So what do I do? I buy wine. Let's say 5, 10 units, more or less. It will increase the demand by quite a bit. Not a huge amount, but it will be increased. Then what do I do? Then I sell all my wine in one bulk. For the increased price, because the demand is higher. What happens? The demand goes skyrockets back to bottom, if you can skyrocket back into bottom. The price goes super low, so nobody else can do that trick after you did it. And you gain a very nice return of dust up from this. You can get very wealthy from this. I tried it. I, gained, I got very wealthy very nicely from this kind of trick. So it is something you can do. You ruin the market for everybody else, so other players in multiplayer will hate you. But the market will recover after some time, so it's okay. They won't hate you too much. And in all honesty, if you can do it, then why not? You are roving class. That's how you prosper. This is my general idea on how you can deal with marketplace. It's a fairly good idea indeed. What else can you do? 
I'll discuss this in the next video because there are also other ways to actually turn your industry because if you have a lot of industry you have nothing to do with it there are ways to turn your industry into dust in a very efficient way because you can also sell things on the marketplace that you can create via industry I'll talk about it though in the next video guys because this one is fairly long now before we end this video guys however because I will need to end it nobody likes when videos are too long and I also want to upload it relatively quickly so the other thing, oh come on, there we go, other thing you can do, uh, right now I'm being very unlucky by the way, because I should be gaining more luxuries and strategic resources from those rooms, but that's okay, we can wait. And, oh, so, uh, Senex, oh that's something I forgot completely about. Alright, some minor factions, I'm super lucky, because there are two minor factions that you want the most when you're playing as, uh, as roving clans. The first minor faction that you want to be on the lookout for when you're settling or when you want to settle in a new area, uh, wait, I forgot the name now. Uh, that's embarrassing. Oh yeah, I now remember. Ah, uh, the boss. Can I see the on the marketplace? No, nobody's here. That's annoying. Whatever. The boss. Those are the centaurs, if you remember. Why do you want the boss to be on your side? Oh, it's very simple. One, as a unit, they can keep up with your army because they have a lot of movement. So you can mix them in with your primary army and they will not slow you down. That's a very nice thing. And not too many neutral units can say the same thing about themselves. So boss, nice addition to your army, although a bit repetitive because they are not that different from Dervish. However, the boss also gives you a 5% food production on your city per e uh, on, by default and also an additional 5% food production per village pacified. Which is very important because as I said previously, as roving clans you need this food. So in my eyes, boss, the best thing you can get. What is the second best option? That's slightly marginally worse than the boss. That's what it is. Silex are amazing for you because A. Their units are exactly what you need. As the Roman class, you do not have a unit that has a high amount of health and a high amount of damage all in one packet. This guy, however, is a bulking beast. He can take a lot of hits, he doesn't move fast at all, but he is pretty hard to take down and he deals nice damage as well. What do you want with him? You want him to guard your cities. That's what you want with him. You don't want to attack with him. No, 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 no. You would sacrifice your greatest advantage, which is your speed. However, with him guarding your cities, you feel much safer because your normal units would not be the best city guards. Let's be entirely honest about it. What is, however, the other advantage of Silex? That's what it is. Because you will gain extra resources from Silex. And what do you, do you do with those extra resources that the Silex give you? Yep. You guessed it, you sell them for extra profit! That's what the Roman clans do! So Silex, really good. If you want to look for a third possible minor faction, then as always, the Erekes. Because they're always good, they can be your tanks to defend your cities, and they give you extra speed, because hey, when you have a ton of speed, why not have it even more, right? Actually, I believe it's a bit of an overkill, so that I don't, I don't tend to get Erekes as a Roman class, but this is, it is an option still, and it can be even faster, it can be uncatchable if you have Arrakis on your side, which is a nifty little idea, isn't it? Alright, I seriously need to end this video, guys, it is seriously way too long, but there is one last thing I just want to hint at before we end, because it is seriously quite interesting, and uh, that's annoying, I will not be able to do that. But I'll try to get this quest done as quickly as possible, because it will be a fairly nice reward. Because, last for loot, it's a good quest, because it can give you a lot of luxuries or resources, other resources that you will be able to trade, which is important. So, last for loot, yeah, prior to that. You can get unlucky though, and you can get items, which is not that good, but whatever. Anyway, as I was trying to say, one last thing I want to hint at before ending this video cast. I did mention that I was able to conquer a Necrophage Empire very early in the game without even declaring war. How? That is how. Mercenary Corps, a technology that is in Era 2. It allows your mercenaries, so that those are all mercenaries that you buy from the marketplace in this tab. It, those mercenaries will gain the ability to turn them into privateers. Privateers appear as neutral armies for any of your enemies, so they will not be able to tell a difference between a minor faction army that will just spawn on its own and an actual army controlled by you that you use to wreck the enemy with. I want to wait another turn to show you exactly how this works, but I guess I will not be able to. So this is very nice, but how is this very nice? 
It allows you to launch uh, to launch surprise assaults on the enemy. It allows you to potentially act in a harmful way against your allies or friends. Because yes, you can now backstab your friends very easily. You can just buy out a bunch of mercenaries and grab the stack. And those mercenaries will, in all actuality, be able to attack your friends. Because what's cooler than backstabbing your friends? Nothing, let's be honest. So you can do that. But you can take it one step further. As I said, units composed entirely out of mercenary units, when you have this technology, it will be classified as neutral units. What can neutral units do? They can besiege and capture your cities while declaring war. They are neutral units, after all, they did not declare war, they are just your enemies. Right? So if you buy out mercenaries, if you give them this technology, which is fairly easy to access, I mean, I always rush it, I always rush it, always as roving clans. So let's say I get this technology, I buy out a bunch of mechs, like Ended for example, and then I give, I activate the Privateer ability so nobody knows they are with me, although humans would guess, but it doesn't matter, because it doesn't matter if somebody guesses that they are with me, I'll still be able to move into the enemy territory, attack the enemy without declaring war on them, capture their city, and have the enemy city as my own, without ever declaring war. Do you understand what I just said? I can capture the enemy cities, I can, well, no, I can capture allied cities without declaring war. Do you imagine even, I cannot do that yet, the consequences of that? Do you? Can you think of this? I bet you can. Just, I'll let you think about it for a second. Do you feel the music? Oh, I bet you do. Because if the enemy wants to recapture the, all their old cities, do you know what they, they have to do? They have to declare war on you. Because you never officially declared war on the enemy. It was just some rebels that captured the city and somehow gave the city back to you? Without you ever having to declare war on anybody? It actually works! So you can uh, invade the cities of your best friend, take them over and be like, what you gonna do about it? Declare war on me? Oh, this will be considered a backstab, I'll have you known. I'll have you know. This is sick and amazing and I love it. That is a little sneak peek of what we will be doing in this playthrough. Now, just before I end, I need to stress out, artifacts also have mercenary cops. It is a technology widely available, but they can only get it in era 4, in the 4th era. It is right here, it's usually in the middle though. Right now for us, in the middle there's signal cops, but usually in the middle, right here, if in era 4, every other faction has mercenary cops. We have it in era 2. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you play warmongering roving clans. If you want to see more of that, you have to watch my next videos. So, ladies and gentlemen, it was Panchasu, the most evil of people apparently. Thank you very much for watching, I am also known as the Mighty Mix Spammer, and if you somehow much to enjoy this video cast, then please do show your support by liking and leaving a comment below, because I like reading those comments, they help me a great deal as well. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you online, and we'll do some wicked stuff together.